Welcome to God Hockey Episode 7. Today, I talked to Mandy Cronin from Empower Hockey. She's one of my favorite people in the industry, and we talked about her life in the game, the road she's traveled, and some of the challenges along the way. Make sure to like and subscribe. We'll let you know when more content is available. Now let's get to the episode. Episode 7 with Mandy Cronin of Empower Hockey. All right, so here we are. We're kicking off episode seven of God Hockey. Today, I've got a good friend of mine. We've got Mandy Cronin. She's sort of done it all when it comes to women's hockey. And today, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about life and everything that goes into it. Uh, Mandy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Dana. Absolutely. Uh, again, I, I've said this a couple of times to, to different people I've had on, but you're right at the top of the list of of, uh, of the people I, I wanted on and, uh, it took us a couple of tries, but, uh, here we are. So it's these guys fault little kids. Yeah, we'll blame the children life. when all else fails, <laughs> exactly. blame the kids. Of That's course. Right. <laughs> so, uh, growing up, obviously, I mean, you're, you're Toronto based now, mm-hmm. uh, you're from the U S you're from Maine. Yeah. I was born in Ohio, but grew up in Maine. Okay. And that's where you, that's where you started hockey. That's where you became yep. a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, I'm the baby of five. So my next older brother got into it and I think, I think I just did whatever he did. So <laughs> jumped yeah. into, jumped into hockey maybe when I was about five years old, but I didn't become nice. a goalie until I was 12. So that I was a late bloomer in net. Wow. You know what you, you do, you do get those every once in a while. I think even, I think Malcolm Subban wasn't a goalie until he was around that age. Yeah. And, you know, obviously it worked for him. Back. Super, yeah. super, super athlete. I think he could have been anything. You know? Oh yeah, probably. <laughs> now okay so you you become a goalie what what drew you to the position um I I was not a standout player by any means I think okay. I was just having fun playing I couldn't score goals I don't think I ever drove the net uh, mm-hmm. and but I, I I don't recall why but I was just playing uh it was Dover youth hockey like just local mm-hmm. you know house league kind of hockey and um but there was a it still exists uh, it's called the Seacoast Spartans um at the time it was just boys. Now they have a girls program. So I'm really happy about that. But at the time it was just elite boys. Um, and I don't, I I can't tell you why, why I wanted to try out because I was not, I don't recall being a very good player. Uh, but I, I tried out uh, when I was 12 and, um, and I, I didn't get selected as a player, but, uh, I think the general manager of the organization uh, told me that they, they were going to have a goalie tryout because one of their goalies wanted to be halftime goalie, halftime player. And, um, and I, I beat out four or five other boys. I had never put the pads on and I <laughs> nice. did a goalie trout and I beat him for it. So I think it was just, uh, it was meant to be a goalie. Just that so, you're a natural. You're just yeah, a natural. It was, it was a phenomenal experience. The boys took me right in. I got to play halftime goalie, halftime player. Wow. And yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Okay. So if we go back to that a little bit, maybe that's, maybe that's something that uh, for a lot of girls and women that they don't necessarily experience because there is so much girls and women's hockey now so right from that young age you were always playing with boys uh I was you know it was co-ed I there were maybe a couple of girls um yeah so I I probably started skating at five and then um yeah it was 12 I was 12 13 years old that season and um, again I don't remember there being another girl I don't think there's another girl no sorry I was the first girl ever to play with the Seacoast Spartans so there was no other girl um and then the next year I started playing girls hockey. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, just being in Maine, as much as it is a, it's a Northeast uh, community. So you've got some hockey roots obviously there, but yep. still from a, from a, um, a number standpoint, there, there probably just wasn't enough involvement to have uh, leagues and teams. I, I, I think they were, I, I wasn't aware of them. Um, right. I, I, I was just playing house league then join the Spartans. And then again, I'd have to pick my parents' brains about how I ended up jumping, but there was a program called uh, the New Hampshire selects. And then there was the main uh, goodness, any of my main uh, colleagues who see me forgetting their name are going to be a little upset with me, but there was the main <laughs> team as well. I think they might've just been main selects, but, but it was, it's almost like going from Toronto to Algonquin. Uh, the team in Maine, Maine is huge. And right. uh, the team in Maine was so far North that it actually made more sense for me to just 20 minutes across the border and play for the New Hampshire team. Okay. So, uh, so I joined the New Hampshire selects, which was the girls program and played with them uh, for a year or two prior to high school. And then I also, I went to prep school to play hockey. And um, so I played with the selects during uh, while I was playing. So you got to do both. 
Yeah, I did both. My Double parents duty. came up every weekend and got me, <laughs> went to see, uh, went to my selects games while I was also playing for the school. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then Lucky. from there you, you graduate and you head off to the university of Maine. Yeah. I don't want to skip over New Hampton though. That was okay. Uh, no, no, was, keep going. That was, I, I will tell everybody to this day that New Hampton was a, uh, it was the best experience of my entire life. I would take it over my college and pro experience. It was just the, uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm a baby of five. My parents weren't loaded. Um, and, and I thank them every time I think of it for, for doing whatever they had to do to make ends meet, to, to put me through and get financial aid and all that to, to do the New Hampton thing. But I was playing with the New Hampshire selects, had a game at the New Hampton campus, but the way they had the arena situated, it was behind the gymnasium and the beautiful campus was behind that. So I never saw the campus. I didn't know I was on a school campus uh, and then they had a, a recruiter. They were trying to build up their women's sports programs at the school. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a private school. And uh, I, I knew nothing about private schools. I didn't even know they really existed. And um, they came up to me after the game and asked if I wanted to look at the school. And one thing led to another. And I, I fell in love with it. And it was, um, I, don't, I don't know, unless you have a young boy or girl playing hockey here and they're elite and you're looking at opportunities, I don't think many Canadians know about the new England prep school life. And, and, uh, it's huge for hockey opportunities in the future mm -hmm. too. Um, so that that's where a lot of my college opportunities came from because I was playing at new Hampton and playing for the selects at the same, same time. So I, I had a lot of exposure at tournaments, but uh, all the division one coaches that, I, that were recruiting me came to watch me at new Hampton. So just um, the association was yeah. a bit of a yeah. foot in the door type of thing. Yeah. And just the opportunity to, to, um, to practice every day in our own rank and, I played other sports at the school. So it, it was just a, it was a phenomenal experience there. And that's then, pretty good. Then that's, 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 um, I guess like how you say, like they, the part of, part of the, the pitch or whatever of, of recruiting you was that they're, they're starting, they're trying to build up their women's sports. And, and you're, I get, you're, you're like the perfect age that you, like you you really blazed a lot of trails, uh, so to speak, you know, in that, you were right in that first generation where, um, wh where there would have been those opportunities and they were becoming available. They were becoming things. So it's, it's amazing. You were able to sort of take advantage of those as they, as they came. If you were, if you were a few years older, you may have gone sh straight through without even having that, um, without even having those opportunities and we, and we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Now, honestly, I, I, I'm, uh, I have a lot of faith in me and I, I am very, very grateful and blessed for, like you said, where I was, I feel like that's, that's my life. I, my parents will tell you the same thing. I just, I've had so many opportunities fall into my lap. Mm -hmm. I was at the right place, the right time. That's how the CW started. And we can get into that a little later, but I'm sure. um, just being in the right place, at the right time, talking to the right people. And, um, but if I hadn't gone to New Hampton, I wouldn't have built the confidence to be able to speak out and, and get people's mm -hmm. attention for things. So, um, so I'll always give credit where credit is due. My parents, first of all, yeah. for making it possible with four older kids that they were taking care of financially mm -hmm. um, and still finding a way to make it possible for me to go to New Hampton and grow as a person yeah. and as an athlete. Cause I played soccer and, and hockey there and, and uh, softball. Um, and I started the softball team there, we built the field. Um, it, it was just, the whole thing was amazing. So, and, yeah. Well, they say, I, I think the saying is like, luck is the, the intersection of opportunity and hard work. So uh, clearly, clearly you've had a little bit of both and yes. uh, you've, you've put it all to good use. So, yeah, I try. Um, so, okay. So maybe we, maybe we can talk a little bit about Maine then was that, yeah. was that, so just, just sort of looking at it was, would that have been a school that was always on your radar from being from Maine or was there? No. Okay. No, they didn't have a program. I, I was the first person ever to sign with their program. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. I didn't realize that that's again, yeah. same thing. Same <laughs> I thing. know that's my, my life has been a, a I, I picture when I'm 60 or 70, I'm going to write a book called pioneer or, or trailblazer or something. I don't know. Yeah. I, not because I feel, wow, look what I did, but look what I kept falling into these opportunities that just kept happening. It's not vain. It's no. not, it's not out of vanity. It's the, it's just, yeah. it's the truth. And, I think it's cool. and so I think it, it's cool it fits that I got to do all this stuff, you know, why not somebody mm -hmm. else? And, and a lot of other people have been able to do these things. Um, but yeah, it, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So I, I, I don't know if there's a question there about me, but it was just, I, the, the program didn't exist. Um, and, and division one sport, uh, division one hockey for women was 
just becoming, I, I think when I signed at Maine and started, I started at Maine in 1998. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, there were only nine division one women's hockey programs. Okay. In, That's in across the, the country. Yeah. I, Not in your conference. No, across the country. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. There's 60 something. I don't know. I, I don't even know yeah. how many there are now. Um, plus division three. And, you know, there's so many women's programs now. And then Canadian college hockey. There's just, mm -hmm. there's so many opportunities now. There were, I think there were nine division one programs. So, um, and I was talking to most of them, um, Princeton and Yale and Northeastern, and then a couple of division threes, um, main, if I remember correctly, came in pretty late. Uh, and it was that there was always this Thanksgiving tournament. I think the Thanksgiving tournament was in Rhode Island and the Christmas one was in Connecticut. Those are the ones everybody always went to in New England. And, uh, all the college coaches that were around would come to those. And, uh, I, I remember Rick Filigaro was the, the first ever main coach coming and talking to me. And, um, I, I really wanted one of the Ivy leagues. I thought that, you know, it's an Ivy league and, and that'd be pretty cool to play at a prestigious, nice program. Little, you know? Yeah. It would have been pretty nice. And then I thought, you know, I was, I was a pretty good student. I worked pretty hard, but I had to work really hard for my grades and try to balance everything out. And I, I wasn't just a gifted student. I really, I, I'd like to say I worked really hard for those grades that I got, mm -hmm. and I, you know, just trying to think of an Ivy league education and a brand new division one athlete. I, can I balance that? I don't know. Um, I, I was definitely concerned about how that would have been. And it was more the money. Um, the Ivy leagues couldn't give, uh, scholarships. So I probably, right. would, I, I really liked, uh, Jeff Campersall was the coach at, at Princeton. I loved him. He was, he was awesome to, to talk with. I actually just found a bunch of my old letters from Cornell and, uh, Princeton and Yale. And I found a bunch of them just, uh, about two, three weeks ago when I was visiting my parents, they had me going through a bunch of old stuff and I found all the recruitment letters and everything. It was so cool to find. Um, but it came down to, um, you know, Rick, Rick really pushed on me that I could be a home hometown first person to sign, uh, cost was phenomenal as an in-state student. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, um, he promised that the first year, because you're only, you know, as a first year program, I don't know what it's like now with that, but you're only given so much money as a program for yeah. scholarships. And then, you know, it grows. So the first year he said, you'll, you'll have a, a half scholarship in the, the final three years, you'll, you'll be full scholarship. The other schools couldn't offer that. So um, right, I right. felt that, that was, uh, it was just a, an awesome opportunity. So I, that's, that's what led me to go to university of Maine. I was three hours North of my, of my family. So um, perfect. You know, right. Yeah, it was close. And so, okay. So for a team just starting out, how did you guys do? We struggled. Um, yeah. you know, we were, we had, when I came in, they had a club team. So, uh, the first year, I think we had four or five goalies coming into tryouts. Okay. <laughs> there were a lot. Um, one or two were, you know, s stayed back to try out from the club team. And then uh, I think coach brought in two or three of us. Um, we had 22 freshmen coming in. That's, that's rough. You know, there's, there's that's no a lot. Yeah. There's really no that's veterans to look to because there were, there were veterans. It's like uh, an expansion team. Really? Honestly. Yeah. But, you know, at least with an expansion team, you're bringing in other NHLers that's, that's maybe true. been in the league for years. These, we true. were all 18 year olds coming in. There were a, a couple of veterans that made the team the first year from the club team. Yeah. We did have a couple of veterans there with, you know, good leadership. Um, the skill just wasn't all there yet for a division right. program to compete against Brown, Northeastern, you know, some of the bigger programs. Well, and, and even just all of the things that go into a team. You know, yeah. like the fact that you, someone would have been on the team for three years or the coach knew who he could rely on. And they yeah. had those, those things were things where, you know, you don't have any of that, that, that also makes it a little bit, a little bit trickier. Yeah. Yeah. I think by our senior year, we maybe hit 500. <laughs> we, we weren't, uh, we weren't solid um, until towards the end and it took, took some growing pains, but it was. That, that's what I did. That's what I did in New Hampton too. All of our teams were the same thing at New Hampton. I came in and my goalie partner was a girl who had never played hockey. I was basically right. mentoring her to play, but it was, that's what made the experience awesome. And we won two championships by the end. Um, so it was, you know, I'd been there already at New, Ham at New Hampton. So it wasn't a far reach for me at Maine. I felt good about the fact that we were building something. It was, it was exciting to be a part of that. Wow. Yeah. So you come out of, you come out of college and now we move into the, again, the formation of something else. We're looking at the formation of the original NWHL. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, to be honest with you, I'd have to look back when the former NWHL was created. So mm -hmm. it was already established all the Olympians, you know, heifers, yeah. heifers are all in there playing in it already. Okay. 
So, um, yeah, so I can't take any credit for building that, but okay, uh, well. joining with them though, uh, was a great experience. And so you played when, so when you were, um, what team were you, were you with? I hopped around a little bit. So the first, okay. the first three years, so I played 10 years altogether, uh, in Canada in the pro league. So yep. first, first three years was, uh, the Durham Telus lightning with okay. the old NWHL mm -hmm. and then one year with the Toronto arrows. And then at the end of that year was when the NWHL folded and we built the CWHL in 2007. And then I was with Brampton for Brampton Thunder for four years, Boston for one year. And then I finished with Burlington. Um, and then they, the Burlington club folded after that. Right, right, right. A bit of a wild ride. Um, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a, when, when you're in those leagues, when you're, when, when stuff is starting and obviously like there are, there are struggles and, and even the, the women's game now is still, I think it's trying to, trying to find itself. Yeah. And um, the, the, the difficulty obviously are, are the revenues, you know, like if, if, you know, where, where, where does the money come from? And, and it's, so it's difficult to maintain that, maintain your rosters and, and do yeah. all those, all those kind of things. Yeah. Um, did you ever have like, um, nationally, were you ever on the, the, the radar, uh, for the, for the U S team? Like, were there, like, I always say like how many banana peels <laughs> away from the, from the Olympics, you know, would you, would you have been? Uh, well, the, the feeder program was, uh, at least in my impression was a little different than the way it worked here. Um, you know, we got to try out in our regions. So I actually, you know, the, the program started when I was in my teens and, yeah. uh, you know, we'd go to regional tryouts. If you made it there, you'd go to the next tryout. And then eventually there was always a, a national summer camp for the mm -hmm. top, however many, you know, 30, 40, 50, uh, female players at different age levels. Um, so I, I made that, uh, I want to think, I want to say when I was 17, uh, 16 or 17, I made, there were two different years. I made, I made the national camp in the summer. One was, um, I made the actual camp where it's, um, like I said, so many players and so many goalies, uh, all in a certain age group. Um, and you go to Lake Placid to the Olympic training center. It was awesome. It was, you're there for a week. Um, you know, the nutrition, the training, you're just basically getting an eye opener to what it's like to be in the national program. Yeah. So, I made that. And then, um, uh, I think it was the following year or the year before that. I, I just can't remember which one I did when, but one year I did that. And the, the other year, uh, I didn't make the, I don't know how they selected it, but they separated them. So I, I made the, it's, it's now, I, I believe it's still called the Warren Strelo camp, but that's, it's for the top, um, the top U S female and male prospect goalies. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I made that and it was, uh, I think it was 13 male goalies and seven female goalies from across the country. And I was one of those seven. So I, I got to go to, um, that one was in the Colorado Olympic training center and it was just, just all goalie all week. It was awesome. It was, it was very, very cool. Um, and then after that, I went to Maine. Uh, I didn't have any interaction with the national program while I was in college. So I thought I'm off the radar. Uh, I'm just playing pro having fun. I'm not doing anything more. Um, but Maria Lewis was one of my assistant coaches at Maine when I was there. Okay. Uh, and when I was playing with the Durham Telus Lightning, I think it was my second year there because uh, I started there in 2002. Um, 2004, she came up to watch a game because back then, uh, my wife Mandy Cole, she's six and a half years younger than me, so she was she played pro with us on the Durham Lightning at mm -hmm. 15 years old. We had <laughs> we had like five of them um, that you know, they were so good that they were playing with us instead of playing in the current PWHL, they were playing with us against Sonahara, Hefford, Wickenheiser. And right. we, we had a lot of, um, Jen Wakefield was one of them. She played on the Durham lightning with us, you know, she's an Olympian now. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, it was, uh, so I just lost my train of thought there when I started talking about picturing all the, uh, picturing the young ones playing with them. Well, Brand yeah, come up and watched one of our games to recruit those 15, 16 year olds. And I had changed equipment and everything. So she didn't know who I was. And, uh, and then when she realized who it was, she came up to me afterwards and said that I, you know, I was the old year goalie. I was old school stand up style with these like rolly pads. And the game had just started to change to butterfly style. And uh, I had started, started to transform my game. So she didn't recognize me in new equipment and a new style. Right. From when I played at Maine. Um, so when she came up afterwards, she said, you, I am going to tell Ben Smith, he was the U S Olympic coach. 
I'm going to tell him that you need to be invited to camp. And I was like, what? I thought, I thought it was done. I thought it was, <laughs> so it was uh, mind blowing. I got invited to, <clears throat> but Ben Smith himself reached out to me, wrote me a letter, invited me to, um, the team had already been selected for the upcoming four nations cup in 2004. Oh, okay. um, so the team was there and I was just being brought in individually to join them and see how I stacked up against them. So it was really, really cool. That was the first An time extended I- tryout basically. Yep. Yeah. It was just their, their week before the four nations, they brought me out and um, that was the pinnacle of my career personally, yeah. because um, I was on the ice with all the best female players in the U S at the time. Right. In the so who would your, yeah. who would the partner goalies have been? Who would you have been on with then? Pam Dreyer and uh, oh, okay. Uh, Shanda Gunn mm-hmm. um, who ended up, I, she, she played in one or two Olympics. Um, but uh, I, you know, I got to actually, that time at the light lake placid olympic training center i wasn't a teenager just learning the ropes i was right with the team um and i had people like corinne by around me who was just like just so strong and i uh i got to walk into the dressing room and see the team usa jersey hanging in my stall it was it was amazing i mean that, I that, the team, yeah. that was enough I, I got to play in exhibition games with team usa and it was i have pictures of myself my parents came and took pictures of me and I one of my favorite pictures is just in a, a break in the play I'm in the crease and I'm just staring at the at the USA logo it's one of my favorite <laughs> pictures because I that's it like that's what everybody wants so I I got Pinch cut. Me. yeah yeah is this really happening I I got cut um at the end and I was devastated and it actually ruined the rest of my season that year and um okay so I, I ended up the team ownership of the lightning changed and uh, they brought in a new goalie and kept my, my second goalie. So that's when I left to the arrows. So I, I just, I had a bad rest of my year, so I don't blame them for getting rid of me, but that's why I switched to the arrows. But so it was a, you know, at that moment, it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me because hockey was my life. Yeah. Looking back, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was all I ever wanted. My mom wanted to get me a USA Jersey when I was younger. And I, I remember telling her at the mall, you can't buy me one of those. The only way I'm going to wear that is if I earn it. Yeah. So that was that moment. I was like, I did it. I, I have it on me. So here I am. Yeah. I yeah. didn't make the team, but I was, I was well, there and I had earned that. Yeah, so you were cool. Close enough. You're a lot closer than, than <laughs> a lot of, a lot of kids were. Yeah. Uh, certainly cool that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's phenomenal. So there you go. Two banana peels away. There you go. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll mark that down. I'll that it, file that. <laughs> and so, I mean, obviously a great, a great playing career all the way up, you know, uh, we detailed that and, and it's, it's, it's amazing where it, where it took you. Right. And now as you wind that down, I mean, even when you were still playing, when, when, when I first met you, you were already, it was because you were coaching and um, I met you that way. And as you move on your, you start your own school. And that's, that's really what, what I want uh, sort of the meat of this to be where we talk about exactly um, your, I guess your inspiration for it and just the way you, you come together, the school's called Empower. Uh, it's perfect because M for Mandy and, and, and it, the school is meant to empower young, young women and girls as they interview me. You already know. There well, exactly. I, yeah. I could have done this by myself. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and really, but I, I'd, I'd love to get your, your take on the beginnings of it and, and how it all came to be and, and why that was important to you to, you know, even, even just the naming and how you see everything as it's now moved on for uh, a number of years now. Yeah. Yeah. I I started in, I think 2006, the end of 2006. Um, Mm -hmm. So 15, 16 years now that, that we've been doing this and um, I love it. And it's evolved obviously and COVID has forced it to evolve. Um, But yeah, I guess the, the inspiration for it, where it came from, um, Partially, I was an American up here trying to figure out what I was going to do for work. Um, and I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, Jamie McGuire, uh, McGuire goaltending. Yeah. He, was, he was my goalie coach. Um, he actually, I got introduced to him by one of my goalie friends right when I was, when I got that invite to the Team USA camp. Um, I was 24 and uh, I, I knew that my game needed to evolve. It had to adapt to the new style. I was still stand up, but I was kind of doing the butterfly. I was a weird. That's that is a big piece of why I started doing what I did. Mm-hmm. That experience in 2004 killed me because I knew if I had had someone doing what I'm doing with girls now, 
yeah. teaching me from when I was 12, when I started, mm-hmm. I would have, I believe that I, I would have, if I didn't make the Olympic team, I would have been a, a fierce competitor for the Olympics. Yeah. I, I was, and I don't say that lightly making the Olympic, you know, being an Olympian no, no. much I, more I, than being a good goal. Yeah. Again, that's not team. vanity. That's, that's the truth. I think, um, yeah. the, you know, the infrastructure just wasn't there to have that for you at that, at that age. No, it wasn't consistent. You know, I had the goalie coach, but I'd have to go to like their backyard rink or something. Or I'd join their boys camp and it just, it yeah. just wasn't, it wasn't mm-hmm. enough at the time. And I, you know, I don't think families are in the new England area anyway. Um, my parents didn't know that they should have me in goalie camps and I don't right. think they were as readily available. So anyway, uh, long story short, just I, that experience of going to that camp and realizing I'm still stuck in a transition between the old style and the new style. If I knew the new style and I was playing it regularly, I think I would have cracked that lineup, even if I was the third goalie. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were just times I, you know, I replayed that camp in my head and I was like, I even got caught in some weird positions because I had been learning the new style, but my body wanted to do the old style. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure they saw that and said, she's not even comfortable in her own pads right now. So that played a big part in it. Um, I, and I realized too, that I I talked, you know, with working with McGuire, because he was my goalie coach, he fully transitioned my game. And he's the reason I continued to play for 10 years, because if I hadn't transitioned a goal, much better goalies would have come uh, younger goalies and taking my spot, but because I kept training with him and evolving my game, I was able to stay competitive for, for 10 years after college. Um, but I realized while working with him, um, there was no female running a year round goalie school for females. Nobody, yeah. you know, I think Sammy Joe, after the Olympics started running a, a summer camp for girls, but it was one or two weeks out of the whole summer. That's all they got. You know, she didn't work with teams. So there, you know, there are people like that who would Maybe they were doing it on a small scale, but nobody was right. doing it anyway. So um, I I just saw this opportunity to be a mentor to young female goal, goalies and let them know that they don't always have to be at a boys camp with boys. Yeah, there, they, there's a place. And, and I don't think anyone thinks there's anything wrong with being on a mixed team or in a mixed no, camp, but, absolutely not. but at a certain time in a certain place, some it's it's also okay to say, I'd rather just be in a group with all girls. Well, it's also the competitive nature, you know, you're, especially when you get to an elite level, which is you've, I've had you come out to my my lead international female goalie camp, um, for a bunch of junior and college and pro females to be training together. It's such a unique experience. They're used to being out with, you know, if it's a pro female goalie, yeah, she wants to be out with pro male goalies and male shooters because they're going to push you of course, but there's something really unique about being out there with just your colleagues. And, and now am I the best goalie out here of all the female goalies? It's, it, it, it was that particular camp was the one that I got the best reviews for from the athletes themselves. I still mm-hmm. have pro goalies reaching out to me saying, are we going to run it this summer? And I'm like, I, I can't, the way the restrictions are on the ice. Uh, and, and I brought coaches in from all over from the U S yeah. and everywhere to do that. It's just too hard with travel restrictions, number restrictions, all that. Yeah. Um, even some of the camps that I was going to run this summer, I usually do a camp up in, up in Concarton where my wife's uh, dad lives. And, um, I bring staff in, I rent a house and we have all these kids out there where it's really cool. I've run a few camps out in that area. Um, and I've actually been asked, you know, kids would come to that camp and say, can you start a camp a half an hour over in, uh, in Goderich. And then can you start another one over here? Because they don't get, they don't get the experience that you have in Toronto where there's a hundred. Right. No, they're starving for it. It it is, it is hard to, uh, it is hard to find it if you're not in a, in a big community and, and for good reason, if, if you're, if you're running a goalie camp, uh, you know, you've got thousands of goalies in the GTA to, to, to pick from. So uh, where you're in a smaller center, it's, it's a little, little tougher to make it go. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 again, like I always thought it was, it was, it was great the way you did it. Certainly a a unique concept and there's probably others out there who thought this isn't going to work. There is, there aren't enough or there isn't enough interest or you won't be able to, but here we are, like you said, 15, plus years later or so and you know you're still doing it and a lot of the a lot of the young young gals i see 
on TV who are starting to take hold. Like you've got some of them in your camp and, yeah. uh, and, and they're the same ones when I come out and do talks and things like that. And I showcase equipment with, with your goalies a lot. And then we just talk about everything really goalie related. And, yeah. and so I get to even know them a little bit and, and yeah. it's really, um, it's a, it's just a great environment. You know, yeah. I've, I know I've, I know I've always enjoyed it. Um, to hear that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, for sure. I mean, what's, you know, for me, I mean, what's better than talking to a bunch of goalies, you know, exactly. It's, it's, it's been, it's been a big part of my life. So only we understand each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's definitely a wavelength there. Yeah. So now um, we can maybe um, we'll transition this a little bit towards the, the NWHL, which you were a part of for, uh, for a few years as well. I remember, I remember getting a call, uh, from you and Hey, I, I need a, I need an equipment manager for my team in Buffalo. And I was, I, I think I was able to connect you with someone who did, Gosh, yeah, did Jay, eventually he was awesome. come in. He was, I wanted to take him to Toronto with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and, and yeah. And, and shout out to, to Jason Terrio for, I think he was the connection that I made for you to, to find him even. So well, shout out to you. Cause you started that. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> and Buffalo, thank you. thanks you. Cause they still, they still have him. He's uh, yeah, he's awesome. So, so starting off in, in there, you know, what was that experience like? And then we'll move into the Toronto six as well. Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, as, as I said, my business has evolved and these guys, I don't have eight kids. These are two children, lots of pictures. <laughs> I've had other people on zoom calls, ask me how many kids I have. Um, you know, life changes when you, when you yep. have kids, anybody who, who doesn't have kids yet, life changes when you've got children and, uh, you know, the, running a, running a hockey school, um, if people, if your viewers don't know, you are out on the evenings and weekends, which conflicts with their schedule. So, yeah. um, it's, it was really nice with my daughter, our firstborn, uh, to be able to, um, be home with her all the time. But I was starting to realize, you know, I, I need to figure out how to transition this. And I really love managing a sports business. I love interacting with the athletes. Mm -hmm. I love being a mentor, a coach, all of that. Um, and so I had actually prior to starting with the Buffalo Buttes in the national women's hockey league, I had, uh, I had been going down and meeting with, uh, Rebecca Davies, Rebecca, Michael now, and, uh, and Jana Hefford with the CW in their final year. Mm -hmm. Um, because as I mentioned, I was, I played in the CWHL, but I was also a co-founder and a, a board and advisory member. So I had worked closely with, with Jana and, uh, and I had reached out to them that final year of the league and said, I. I'd really like to be back involved, um, whether it's at a community awareness level or alumni relations. So I kind of helped, started helping out with both. Um, mm -hmm. But when I met with them at their office, I told them, I said, I, I, I really think I'm going to be a good general manager. That's what I'd really like to do. Um, and so we, you know, we put the, you know, just the, the wheels in motion for that, that I, I was just going to start being involved at a higher level with the league. So I, at the all-star game down at the Scotiabank center that last year, um, all the goalies that were in uh, on the blue line for the starting lineup. Um, those were all my goalies. I had done a, a contest through empower, uh, for them to be out there. So that was pretty cool for them. And they came up and sat in the stands with us after, after the game got going. Um, and then I was starting to do some work with alumni relations. And, and because I'd mentioned to them that, um, for all of us who had retired, there was no real connection to the league. There was no outreach to the alumni where okay. I felt like, you know, there's the NHL or yeah, the NHL alumni. Mm -hmm. So there was no CWHL alumni association. I felt like they really could use the support of the alumni to spread the word about the league. Um, and then unfortunately the league went under. Um, and, and to me, that was, you know, even though I hadn't been involved with the CW since I retired in 2012, um, it was painful to watch because, um, you know, we can go back to this if you want, but, as I mentioned early on, I, I'm a co-founder. I, I was the one who spoke with the original and brought in the original investors. I uh, just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and played in a ball hockey tournament with them down in the financial district. And uh, to see it fold after 12 years was really, it was hard. You know, we, we, I, we, I, we, I can we, imagine. I can imagine being there right from the very beginning. And then, you know, again, ultimately seeing it uh, kind of go under, it's can't be easy. No, no, for anyone, for anyone of, of, of any involvement anyway, but, uh, you know, not the least of which, you know, someone who was there right from the very beginning. Yeah. So I, um, I just, I know a lot of the people that were involved. Um, I, I didn't really know 
personally a lot of the people that were involved at the NWHL, but I did know a few. And, and one of them was the, I think she was the deputy commissioner at the time, um, Haley Moore with the NWHL. She was one of my teammates when I played for the Boston Blades. Um, okay. So, um, you know, I, I just saw what was starting to happen. Uh, I knew Liz Knox and a lot of the girls that were involved with the early stages of the PWHPA. And I saw the conflict and I just thought this, we can't, this is, this is bad for women's hockey at the time. It just felt like this is bad for, yeah. women. we can't be seen as going at each other's throats. We need to grow. I, 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 I think from my, it. I think from my point of view, um, and, and possibly other like fans or, or, you know, would be supporters or, or however we'll categorize myself and, and others. I think just seeing that there was some amount of separation and some amount of like side taking rightly, wrongly, whatever side it is, I don't really know many of the inner details of it besides there's clearly two factions and they weren't getting along. And I just, I, I, I know I would see that and I would think there's no way this is a, this will have a net positive for women's and girls hockey because yeah. you it's, it would, and, and again, I, I don't know the reasons it, it, it got started that way or why it continued and even where we are today with it, mm-hmm. but it's unfortunate that either side, whatever the case may be, that there was, there wasn't a willingness to say, you know what, for the, for the betterment of whomever is coming next and for the betterment of just the game in general and our league moving forward it's it is it really is unfortunate that there wasn't that something wasn't able to be to be done and look if you want to talk a little bit about it obviously without you know without turning this into uh good versus bad here um you know share your thoughts if if you like uh about a little bit about that yeah well like i was saying it's you know i i tried just because i knew people on both sides and i had Mm -hmm. been a a player and a co-founder i just thought um, try to help bridge the gap. And I, I did, I, I connected the leaders at the CW with the leaders of the eventual, you know, they, they weren't called the PWHPA at the time, but, yeah. um, and I wasn't trying to solve their issues. I was just trying to network, right. put them together. Be and a say, bridge. Please, let's try to figure this out. Um, and they weren't able to. And so the PW started, but, um, but then that, that put my, I guess that must've made Haley think about me, they needed someone in Buffalo because the uh, Pegula Sports and Entertainment, the owner of the Buffalo Sabres, had mm-hmm. owned the Buffalo Buttes, and they gave the team back to the league. Um, so they needed someone to come in and rebuild the team. Um, and Haley reached out to me just out of nowhere. We hadn't even – I hadn't talked to her. I had talked to, to Danny at the time, who I, I didn't know either. I just was trying to bridge the gap. But um, Haley reached out and asked if I would like the opportunity to join the NWHL and be the – the uh, general manager of the Buffalo Buttes. And, you know, we, we had to have some conversations here at home. Um, that's, you know, that's my business was still my, my sole yeah. uh, income and, and what I was doing full time. Um, so that would take a bit of a hit because to be the general manager of a team in Buffalo, I need to be there often. And that's right. two hours plus a border crossing. If there's any delays there, each direction. Plus that's the just, time that's just tra- yeah, that's just travel. Never mind work. Right. And, uh, that was, uh, the 2019, 20 season and my daughter was born in 2017. So she's mm-hmm. you know, two years. So I was also asking my wife to take on, um, taking care of her while I was gone. It's so tough it to navigate. Years. Definitely tough to navigate that family side of things. Yeah. And it, you know, without getting into the details of it, it's not a full-time job pay wise, but it is a full-time job time wise. Yeah, so yeah. I wasn't getting paid a lot to do it, but it was a passion project for me and Absolutely. it was a career path I wanted. Um, and like I said, I had started that trajectory with the CW and then unfortunately they went under. So, um, I, I felt like I was, it was, I think the reason it was so tough to accept that position was I didn't want to be seen as taking a side, Mm -hmm. um, because, um, because the majority of the girls involved with the CW were going the PWHPA route. Um, and and for me, I I had to eventually, I, I sought out a lot of my mentors, uh, older coaches and people I'd worked with and, uh, said, do you think this is going to ruin me if I take this job? Because I, I, my living is in the girls and women's hockey world yeah. in, in Toronto. And, and um, so, you know, is this going to be bad for me? But eventually I just thought, you know, this is, I'm trying to keep the game alive. And yeah. so yeah. I'm going to do what I think is right and just 
this is also a good career move. So, um, I ended up taking the job with Buffalo and, um, it was, uh, it was amazing. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, and of course my first year as a GM, um, like I said earlier, I, you know, there are a lot of opinions about what has gone on in women's hockey and women's pro hockey in the last couple Mm -hmm. of years. Um, but, uh, whatever people might think of executives in the NWHL, whether it's good or bad, they were always good to me. And, uh, not just, you know, it's not like they did me favors. We, I grew so much as a professional in this industry that year, because I was learning from people who'd been in the industry for decades. Um, right. uh, whether it was in communications, um, actual being general managers, uh, communicating with league executives, uh, building partnerships, sponsorship. I, I literally had to do everything that year. I had to build our employee staff from nobody to everybody that we had. I had to recruit our entire team. We had no one. Everybody that had been on the team either just stopped playing because they didn't want to get involved with the, the politics yeah. that were going on or they joined the PWHPA. So I literally had to start from scratch with staff and players. I had to find us a new arena. I had to find us an arena with a dressing room that we could have. I, I was able to take all those boxes. So, you know, I built confidence in my ability to do it. Um, and again, that goes all the way back to my parents in New Hampton with, okay, well, I got a new challenge. I'm just going to figure it out. And I'm confident that I can do it by yeah. uh, tapping into my resources, my network, and, and uh, just being supportive of, of people the way they've been supportive of me. So that was, uh, and, and people like yourself just saying, hey, Dana, I need to find an equipment manager. And you found someone who found someone for me. And um, we, we were really... I think the best experience for me, and I, you know, I, I've had conversations with the staff that we had there and the players, and obviously there, it was a really hard year. It was, um, you know, we didn't have all national team players on our team. You know, it was right. players who were willing to put in the work, grind, and, you know, in, in an, uh, a normal year, they might not have made the team, but they recognized that and saw it as an opportunity to put their, their name on the map. Sure. So, um, sure. you know, we were all in that position. So, um, it, it was an amazing experience and, um, I, I, I will always treasure that. I still wear my Buttes hat. It was just, um, it, from, from the hiring the coaches to the staff, to the players, to building relationships in Buffalo, uh, partnerships. Uh, I, I launched the, the NWHL's first ever outdoor regular season game. And, uh, we did it at the, um, oh goodness, they're going to hate me for forgetting what it's called. But anyway, the, the, the big venue in Buffalo downtown there, but it was, it was Riverworks. Okay. It, was amazing. Yeah. it was amazing. It was a sold out event. And, um, you know, just being able to do those kinds of things and bringing in Labatt as the uh, premier sponsor, the uh, presenting sponsor. But again, I had so much support from the league as well with people that they had, whether they were third party um, contractors working with them or actual, you know, employees of the league. They were there anytime I needed, you know, hey, this is something new. I just need a little guidance and put me on the right path. And, and I had it. It, it yeah. was just I, I will forever be grateful as a professional in the sports industry to, right. to everybody that was involved at the NWHL that year. Um, I just, I learned so much and I think I was able to, to do a lot that year for the league and the team and the players and the staff because I had that support from all of them. So, yeah, awesome. well, that must be something when you, when you go through that and you've got all these things to find, all these things to figure out, you end up planning that big game and then you go from, those, those feelings, the anxiety of how are we going to get this done to the big exhale of seeing the puck drop. And now, yep. you know, you like, Ooh, oh, I can take, <laughs> I can take five minutes, you we know, have a team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we yeah. got there. We, we hit the, uh, we hit the finish line. Yeah. So then, then you moved on uh, back to Toronto mm-hmm. with the six. And I guess that's when, that's when it all got wild because we had to deal with, we had to deal with a pandemic and, you know, how do you, how do you go about putting together a team when, I mean, basically I think generally it was all local, basically all local or almost all local because you couldn't really have anyone travel and, and things like that. So how does, how does all of that come together? And, Take me to, and then we'll talk about the season, but take me right to even the very beginning of what was the, that, that semi bubble uh, short season. Uh, Yeah. So I, you know, with the Toronto six, it was again, very hard to walk away from 
what I was a part of in Buffalo, mm-hmm. but we had another baby on the way. Um, our son was born 2020 in May. So um, thinking of doing another year with all that time in Buffalo away from my family. And it was tough being away from my daughter. Uh, you know, she'd give, me the cold, she'd give me the cold shoulder when I was away for a road trip. Um, but it was really important for me to be there on those road trips and, and all that. So, mm-hmm. um, so uh, when I was offered, uh, you know, I was recruited to, to join the six. And when I was offered that job, it was very, very hard to think of leaving Buffalo. I, I, I just so much passion there and I loved everybody there, but I had to do what was right for our family. And, um, so for taking sure. that job, uh, as you said, it was in, in the, the pandemic really started to affect us at the end of the NWHL season that year. Um, yeah. we, because we, we had our, our first playoff game, March 6th week, and I think it was and then the next week. And I think they had to, I think that's when it started to affect everything. So, yeah. Um, so it was everything we did with the Toronto six was affected by COVID, um, mm-hmm. from the start. So, um, yeah, with everything being local, um, I don't know if you're referring to the players or if you're just yeah, saying, basically, oh, I, we know had players I, I know when I looked at, yeah, we, we had, yeah, we had players that, that moved here from Saskatchewan. And so it wasn't all local, they, but they had to move here, um, to play with the team. Um, and we had players, other players that we recruited to join, um, even players that were down in the States that were, we had to work, jump through hoops to make it happen, but they came up and joined us just prior to the bubble. So, um, and I was, uh, I was able to bring Bucky up from Buffalo. Uh, she was our star player. So, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. I, I, in the end, I, I was responsible for about half the, half the roster, um, uh, for recruiting, bringing them in, including the goalies. And so it was, uh, it's pretty cool to be a part of that. And, and yeah, it was, it was very very challenging, but again, I think it was very different from my experience in Buffalo, not just because of COVID, but, um, having a, an ownership group, we, we didn't, the the Buffalo team was owned by the league. Um, okay. So I, I was the authority in Buffalo. I really just reported to the league, um, and the commissioner. Um, whereas with the Toronto team, I had a group of owners and a team president. Um, so, um, everything, I did had to be passed through others. Um, but that meant my, my challenges were different. Um, we had a lot more, um, layers of approval and, and things that had to be done to, to get things done. Um, but I, as I'd mentioned, I, by the end, when everything was all said and done with the bubble, I, I was, uh, responsible for the, the NWHL's largest sponsorship revenue for a single team. Um, I had brought in shoppers. Um, I had brought in Canadian Tire and uh, a local company. Uh, so our team ended up with the most sponsorship dollars of any team, and and that was that was something I did. And I, I was, I look back and I'm like, I I did that. I, I didn't have any experience doing that. But again, it all trickles back to your childhood and what I had the confidence to reach mm-hmm. out to the president of shoppers, Absolutely. president of Roots, and the you know VPs at Canadian Tire and. You never know. You kick a can and you see if, if it opens up. If it doesn't, you try. Yeah, there's and, there and there are in. usually there are usually some dollars available for some things, and you yeah. you you either just end up asking the right person, yeah. or the right person looks at it and goes, "Well, this is something we should be a part of." You know, yeah. this is this is worthwhile. This is definitely worth doing. Yeah. So certainly, and and again, yeah, like an, an overarching theme here is basically you've always had, you've always been willing to to do it. You know, uh, you know, oh, there's a wall. Well, here comes Mandy with the that. sledgehammer. <laughs> Why not? Let's just see if we can put a hole in it just for fun. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. And that's really, uh, you know, that's really an, an unbelievable thing. So we do start that, we do start that bubble season. I, I think you guys came out a little flat the first game. I know was. And then, but ended up uh, at the end of the tournament, rattling off a bunch of wins and were, were placed uh, right there. I think it was just going into the semifinals. And then, and then unfortunately there was a bit of a, sort of a bit of a a break in the bubble, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Um, Very unfortunate because I think, because I think what, what the league, what the NWHL, what the teams were, were trying to accomplish I think they were, I think they were doing what they set out to do. I think they really were getting the response they wanted. They were getting uh, the attention that they wanted. Uh, I know the games were all on Twitch. That's where I, that's where I saw a few of them. And, and NBC in the U S yeah. Well, the, uh, yeah. The, well, that's, they would, would have been had it kept going. Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then un- unfortunately it shuts down. Yeah. 
and then we leap forward with there's a there's a gap in between and then uh and then picking it up after it it, it couldn't have been it couldn't have been easy to say the least yeah. um and then you know obviously that that much of a gap it's almost hard to 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 be a team at that point yeah but unfortunately unfortunately that that it had to go that way um and and again hopefully let's let's hope everything kicks off um good now and yeah. you're you're not continuing on with the six for this year and that's uh you know that's your own that's your own uh opportunity for something else now i suppose right yeah. um so it's it's like i said before it's it's sort of a bit of an unbelievable ride when you look at things and you sort of are able to you're sort of able to just sort of, you know, catch a hold and, and, and take you to the next spot. It's, it's, I, I, and again, something I've brought up with, with others in, in the previous episodes I've done, you know, where you've taken hockey as far as you can go, basically as a player, right to a, a U.S. Olympics camp, which, which is really the pinnacle currently for, for women's hockey. Mm-hmm. Uh, you rode that all the way there. you, became a pro player, you started leagues, you've been at the forefront of a lot of these endeavors and you've allowed sort of hockey to always sort of take you to the next stage of your life. And, and who knows like where it goes from there, but it's, it can, it can be a part of your life. And then it can also be, you know, it can also be something that takes you to that, uh, to that part of your life. It's really great. And, and I think too, the one thing that, that I always admire as, and it's certainly a quality you have is your ability to bet on yourself. You know, you say, I, I, when, you know, I know I can do it, or I think I can do it, or (laughs) that's something, that's something I can handle and, and you do it. And I think that's, uh, like I said, that's an excellent quality that you you've always had and it definitely a credit to you in, in whatever comes next along with, of course, you're still successful. uh, You're still successful school. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it, this has been nice to uh, I really enjoyed my experience with uh, working with the NWHL and um, the Toronto Six. Uh, the players, uh, just an, an amazing group of women and our, our partners and uh, our younger staff were, were awesome to work with. And so I, I'm excited to see how they do in the future. And um, it's, it's just like I said, you know, life priorities change and my life is about my kids and my family now. And um, so it's been exciting. I've had some uh, actually a couple of job offers to be a uh, uh, either associate director of admissions or athletics with, uh, some private schools, even back in the U S. Um, and so, you know, exploring those kind of opportunities is really exciting for me and, and, and realizing, you know, this is a shift in your life. It's about you as the hockey player. Now it's about you as what else can I do with my career? And now what can I do for my kids that sets them up yeah. to be successful? And it doesn't have to be, and I get asked all the time, are Brody and Logan going to be a forward or a goalie? Which one? My wife is the, the forward, the goal scorer. That's and I'm true. Goal. So That's they ask true. me all the time and I say, you know what, if they're a basketball player or a soccer player, I don't care. I love those yeah. sports. I just want them to be happy and active. And yeah, I want, so, I want my kids to be uh, good human beings. Exactly. That's, <laughs> it. That's it. And I, I want them to recognize that I, looking back at five or six year old me, even, even 12 year old, 15 year old me, I never would have thought this is, these opportunities were here for me. Um, but that's what I want to teach them and all the, the young athletes that I get to work with every day. And I do, I, I think that's the difference between me as a coach and some other coaches, uh, particularly goalie coaches. Um, you either like my style or you don't. I, I don't just hammer shots at people. I really like to, to savor the teachable moments and whether it's a way that they philosophically think about the game, because mm-hmm. goaltending, as you know, you, you have to be a smart goalie, not just know how to make a block or save or a steer. Um, and, and I think that's, that's life. That's, so much about what we learn in hockey is transferable to life experiences. And that's been my whole life. It's, it's all, you know, hockey has been my vehicle that I've been riding this whole time, but it's allowed me to kind of do whatever I wanted to be able to work with kids. And now I I realize I'd really like to be able to work with kids more than just one lesson per week or per month, but in Mm -hmm. a school setting where, where I can actually be there and pass them the cafeteria and ask them how their school's going, you know, what classes are hard. And, um, because it all goes back to my experience at New Hampton, um, that really shaped me to become a really good athlete because I became a really strong person there. I became very confident. So that's kind of where my shift is, uh, is now is these, these kids behind me and, and, uh, 
wanting to be more a part of the kids' lives that I work with all the time and uh, not just seeing them for an hour on the ice every once in a while. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. well, there you go. You know, M is for mentor and M is for mom. M That's is right. for Mandy. So Love Mandy, it. take a bow, please. And <laughs> I'm going to let you tell us all where we can find you for any, uh, especially the Toronto area, but anyone else who might travel. Uh, yeah. If anyone wants to check out Empower. Uh, where are they going to go and, and how can they find you? Sure. Yeah. I, our Instagram account, uh, Facebook would be the best. And it's just at, uh, you can see that at uh, Empower Hockey, take the dash out of there, but M-P-O-W-E-R uh, Hockey. And uh, yeah, we, we post most of our stuff up there. Uh, Empowerhockey.com is our website. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, we're mostly doing private and semi-private lessons now. Obviously it was very tough right. to try to run camps this summer, yes. but we'll get back to that next summer. And team practices and things like that. But, uh, I also, especially now I have a lot of girls. I've got one starting at Cornell. I've got another one at Liberty. I've got a lot of girls in college and, uh, my, my college network is pretty deep too. So I I'm hoping to launch more programs where we can, uh, mentor young athletes on the recruitment process and things like that. I, I help a lot of kids individually. So I'm planning to launch some more programs that are geared more towards that and helping them plan their futures. Well, Wherever, wherever you go and wherever it takes you, uh, I'm, I have a high level of confidence that uh, you'll pull through it and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll come through the other, the other side. Uh, uh, just great. So keep Thank up, you. keep up the great work. It's great to talk to you, you too, and, and I'm sure we'll probably have you on again sometime. All the Good best time. with the kids and everything. Hey, you managed, you kept them out of the room for a <laughs> yeah. whole hour. That's and, kudos uh, to my wife. <laughs> She's keeping them downstairs. <laughs> it's the you you got to take the small victories. So thanks right. again for joining me today, and uh, we'll we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dana. Take care. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks again to Mandy for joining me today. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll let you know when more content is available. We'll see you next time on God Hockey.